Hey, kings and queens. I got a question for you. What if I just came over to your house, rifled through your closet, picked out all my favorite garments, draped myself in those, draped myself in those, and then went out all night long in your style, your fashion, your clothes, and everybody sees me? Does that make it mine? Let's talk about it. Welcome to We Are Your Aunties. Hey, auntie. Hello, Hello, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> right? Does hello, make, hello, hello. Does it make it mine? Hello, everybody. We are your aunties, and tonight we are just lit. We're on fire with information and content for you and a great topic tonight. We're going to talk about cultural appropriation. And so I really wanted us to start out by talking about what is cultural appropriation, get all the ladies' perspectives, Absolutely, audience, join in, give us your comments, your questions. If you have any jokes, we'll take those too, as long as they're clean. Hi, <laughs> Stephanie, how are you? It's great to see you tonight. And we're just going to go ahead and get started with our definition. And so I took it from Mia Moody Ramirez. She's a PhD at Baylor University. And she says that cultural appropriation is the practice of using or taking something from another culture without giving proper recognition or respect to that culture. She says, what exactly constitutes culture? Culture is the patterns of what has characteristically been constructed as an identity and the behaviors, language, traditions, rituals that are associated with that identity. Where you live, your ethnicity, your race, your religion, and your lived experiences are all examples of identities that can form a culture. At its core, cultural appropriation is, quote, stealing something from somebody that is not you, explained hmm. Lester. Now, that's another um, professional and expert, and that person at Arizona State, his name is Neil Lester. That's what Neil said. And with the last name Lester, we could probably deduce that he's Black. And <laughs> 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 For example, cultural appropriation may occur when you use or wear something that is clearly from outside your identity. And usually the culture that is being appropriated has been or is marginalized. Mm -hmm. Cultural appropriation is about power, said Lester. It's about who has the power to steal from somebody else and not offer any consequences. Another hallmark of cultural appropriation is that the one during the appropriation might be financially benefiting from it without any credit or compensation given. I think that's probably one of the best definitions I've heard of pro uh, cultural appropriation. So let's Amen. get into it, ladies. What, what do you think about this topic? Uh, oh, I'm ready. ready. Dig into it. I'm ready. You know, it's, you know what, it just goes back to, you know, and I, and I don't want to keep harping on this, but it keeps, it just goes back to slavery. It does. And um, so many um, geniuses, so many um, people that come along, you know, African descent and just, you know, made this world, change this world forever with a lot of different things. And it was just, just take it, just take yeah. it. Yeah. Like for a lot of different things, like from fashion to music, oh, yeah. to style, to inventions, to yeah. kinds of intellectual property. Right. And so you're right about that. What about you, Auntie Juno? What do you think about it? Well, um, and, and um, Auntie Rose is right. And a lot of times um, we're still at the bottom of the, uh, we're still at the bottom of the sandwich because of the theft and um uh, the, the colonizers have, have taught everybody that we had nothing of any value to this society. Right. While they're, but they're still continuing to uh, profit 
off the black gold of the land and the black gold is the black bodies mm. the black uh -huh. body the black mind the black gifts the black talents uh, and creativity yeah all of it so mm. i just thought it would be kind of fun for us tonight to go and find some examples of people who have culturally appropriated there are so many that this would have yeah. to 16 hour show to cover everything <laughs> right right <laughs> right I to find some iconic examples yeah. but at the same time you know bring in a few that some people will know about and others won't some mm -hmm. from the past which you know somebody addressed that historically and then bring it up to the present like you know who's doing it now and where does all of this derive from I think like uh like actually I think it was Auntie Rose was saying you know, a lot of this dates back to slavery, but some of it dates further back than that. Because before oh, yeah. Black people were colonized, we still had so much mathematically. We had mm -hmm. done so much in terms of all the things we named. And mm -hmm. they were being stolen then. And then, as Auntie Genoa said, the Black bodies themselves. Us, our mm -hmm. people, our ancestors. I had the most incredible conversation with my niece Khadija today. Hi Khadija. Khadija mm -hmm. Mean. Khadija Diani means. Look her up if you haven't already. She is incredible. She does a lot of the same things that I do. Um and it's on a different kind of scale. She's she's on that level that I'm very, very proud of her. And that was one of the things that we were talking about is how the theft just continues and that it's allowed to continue. And I have kind of two different perspectives on it or two different uh, issues that I want to address mm -hmm. in reference to cultural mm -hmm. creation. And hopefully this will help to frame our discussion as we go through all the, the whole, all the episodes. So one of my concerns is the stereotypes that come with it. How, you know, they will, people who culturally appropriate our culture will pick out certain aspects mm -hmm that they think are so cool and so great, but that set us back like decades when they do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and we'll get into exactly what that is in just a minute. And the other aspect, which is very, very hurtful, is the capitalization, right? Yes. Without compensation. So those two areas are why, what I'm really especially interested in. And then when we get to my episode or my segment, and I really want to go into why it impacts us the way that it does. Because why does it matter? What does it matter if somebody imitates you? What does it matter? I mean, they say that that flat that imitation is the highest form of flattery. Ooh. Is that true? And if it's true, is it in every case? Imitation is nothing if it's not publicized mm -hmm. and if it's not capitalized upon. You know, if you're going to do it and you're doing it in your own home or something, I don't know. It's just it's just an interesting, interesting topic. And so I think that without further ado, because it just seems like we have already addressed what cultural appropriation is. Mm -hmm. so unless one of you ladies has something you want to add, then we're just going to go ahead and get into our next uh, avenue of the show. Well, you know what? Go ahead, go ahead Auntie and Genoa. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't, I, we would be remiss if we didn't mention uh, a long gone icon, Lucille Ball. Um, I saw her in a movie called a, a, a movie when she was young and she's really pretty, but she didn't have those big luscious lips that, 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 that they, that she, that she had on. She used to draw around her own lips and then paint in the color. So it made it look like she had some luscious lips, but she didn't have those. Ah, I love that. And you know, um, back, I guess it was in the 70s or the 80s, I think it was, they used to have what was called Paris lips. And mm -hmm. so that was the beginning of lip injections. Mm -hmm. And we have spades now. You can go almost anywhere, any city, any time, and go in and get yourself some big lips. Mm -hmm. And the thing about that is that, you know, it used to be less than a less than the american beauty standard yes big lips right a big bottom 
dark mm-hmm. skin, like that was considered ugly. Yes. Now, as you know, Auntie Genoa just addressed Lucille Ball, one of the biggest icons in American film history, you know, drew a line around her lips so that she could get what we got mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and capitalized on that. Oh so man, she, did she? So obviously you're going to be focused on what? Her <laughs> mouth. Yep. <laughs> Interesting. Thank you for that one, Auntie Genoa. Anything you want to add to that? You know what? I, you know what? I think I'm just going back to what you were saying earlier. Why it hurts so much? You know, to come up with an idea in the mess that you're in, and I'm talking about slavery and just the being oppressed people, to still be able to be creative, talented, come up with inventions that people have never known, and then have it taken out of your hands, out of your life. Um, away from your generation of, of children that can cap could that can benefit from that that stripped you from everything that is why it's so hurtful for me I remember being um, you know a student at Howard and I had to bring that up because we it was so many stories of um, us being taken stripped things are um, coming things that we invented things that we 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 talked over and it was just snatched away from us the classes was almost always silent after mm. hearing or after learning what we've been through in spite of what we sat in in spite of the beatings in spite of everything we still and still today are being very creative, of being, everyone wants to be like us, but no one wants to be us. Okay, you said it there, didn't you? <laughs> she said it. You said what you said. You know what, and I was just thinking about like the TikTok creators and how we'll get on there and make up some little dance moves. Mm. And then next thing you know, you know, when the white people do it, oh, it's so much more cute and it's so much more, um, what is the word I'm looking for? Novelty. It's much more novel when they entertaining. do entertaining. Entertaining. And how the the creators on TikTok, Instagram, everywhere else, when the black girls get on and they create a new hairstyle, you know, they create a new makeup trend. It's not as good as when the white girl does it with her fake tan and her injected lips and all the things. So it's just very, very interesting. So um, I'm going to ask D.Y. to go ahead and take us into our first segment, if you will. D.Y., take it away. Well, 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 I know you guys are not going to be surprised. Kim Kardashian and her family are this society's biggest offenders when it comes to <laughs> cultural appropriation. <laughs> and Webster says the um, culture, uh, the cultural is the concepts, habits, skills, art, instruments, institutional institutions, etc., of a given people in a given period, um, a, a civilization. And, and it's, it's there they they've used this stuff. And it also says um, for, to appropriate is to set apart for our, uh, or to assign to a particular use and exclusion of all other uses so they um, to get ready for market. <laughs> and the whole family has made millions from the black culture. And the most memorable is her cover, Seven Hollywood. If you can put that up, um, D.Y. for me, where um, she looks like a sister on the cover. Um, she has this um, this uh, sultry look, and um, she does. I when I saw it, even though I know who um, Kim Kardashian is, oh, I, 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 I was thrown off for a minute because she was brown, mm. and she she was she was brown, and um, they and so when I went and did the research and I looked at the actual photo shoot. They had other pictures. They had other pictures of her that looked like her, but they used that one on the cover. They didn't pick any of those. They didn't pick any of those pictures. Um, and the, another one is just the um the, the um the race fakers. I, 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 and it's so funny. 
the most memorable one is that Rachel um uh, Dolezal, D- um Dolezal. That's Dolezal. the lady, the one that was um pr- um pretending to be black um o- over the um the double ACP and and working as an activist in the community and everything. And she had white parents, white. Mm. And um, I watched um, quite a few of her um, her interviews, and um, she just she has not a clue, not a clue at all. Um, and, and she's living the black experience. Um, when, when, uh, in the beginning, she was living the black experience of the successful black one, and now that she's been out here and people see exactly who she is, she's living the normal experience that black people have when they're uh, when when they when they they're uh, talented and have things and everything, and uh, they haven't and, and she's having a hard time. She says she hasn't been able to find a job in six years, and she had to create one to feed her family. Wow. And, and and everywhere she goes, she even changed her name. Her name is Nakechi Amar Diallo, and, nice. and and she and, and people still recognize her. So she still um she hasn't been able to um even uh, catch a breath. And when she talks talks about how people when they see her making comments and everything, you know the cancel call uh, the cancel culture, and she feels that she's not sorry. She's sorry about people's concept of of, of blackness, but she she but she's not sorry for being who she, who she says she are, she is. Um, she tried to make it like she's a like a transgender like like the trans people say. But she's a she's a trans black person. I don't. It, it, it's it's crazy. I mean, and and it's so funny when she says um, when she talks about her experience, and I'm thinking, well, welcome to blackness. You wanted the benefits, and now you're on the uh, on the other side of what we encounter as black women trying to get out here and and make our way. She even she braids hair. She puts in uh, weaves and everything. And those are the only loyal people that's loyal to her right now. It's the ones whose hair she does. <laughs> Very interesting. <laughs> oh, yeah. And then there's um, Jessica Krug. She's a white professor of the African-American studies at George Washington um, University. Um, and, and she's actually a Jewish woman from Kansas. Ah. She's been taking black for years. Uh, another one is a Satuel Cole. Uh, her actual name is uh, Jennifer Lynn Benton, and she's an Indiana-based um, activist, and she's a Black Lives Matter member. She's white, okay? <laughs> um, then there's um, Vitolo Haddad. Um, she pretended to be um, um, either Black or Latino, and she's a uh, Southern Italian or Sicilian. I mean, and it's so funny because none of these people's lives were endangered like the enslaved trying to pass um, for anybody other than themselves so they can save and change their dire circumstances of slavery and just be black. Everyone wants to experience the perks of blackness without the pain of our existence, especially here in the United States. So what you think, aunties? Well, I've got plenty to say. Yes, indeed. <laughs> First of all, let's just talk about Kim Kardashian just for a moment, shall we? Mm-hmm. So I saw an episode of Keeping Up with the Kardashians mm-hmm. where Kim Kardashian went to the doctor to have an x-ray because her sisters were insisting that she had had some surgery done on her derriere. And she went to the doctor and they showed an x-ray like up on that little screen that they put the x-rays up on, the little backlit screen. And of course, it didn't look like she had had surgery, but who's to say that that was her bottom? Let's just <laughs> here. Secondly, with the hair situation, okay, she had uh, the so-called Bo Derek braids. She wore these braids that Bo Derek wore in the 1970s in a movie called 10. And she had her stylist put them in and she wore them and credited Bo Derek to these Fulani braids, first of all. Mm-hmm. If you're going to wear the braids, let's talk about where it really came from. Yeah. Derek, she credited a white woman with having created these braids in a sense by wearing them and crediting her for having worn them first. 
Yeah. <laughs> the funny thing is, she said this. She said this to um, Christopher Polk. She said, actually, I didn't see backlash and did that. And I did that look because North, her daughter, said she wanted brave and asked if I would do them with her. However, it's worth noting that North has never been shown with Kim Kardashian with these braids, number one. And then a few days prior to the MTV Movie Awards, Kar Kardashian West was also criticized for straightening the five-year-old's hair. I don't see anything wrong with straightening her baby's hair, but I do see something wrong with lying because you ain't got to lie to kick it. Because what she said was that she got the braids because Northy wanted her to have the braids so that they could be twin mama and dad, mama and daughter braids, have the same style. She also told Bustle that she chalks up January's backlash to her misattribution of Fulani braids. She says, I do remember the backlash when I had the blonde hair that I called them Boderic braids, but I obviously know they're called Fulani braids. Then why didn't you say that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I won't belabor the point, but I will say this. It's interesting that... Um, we're talking about cultural appropriation. And if you have to culturally appropriate someone, steal their style and you get backlash, then you owe them what? An apology. Yes, you do. And what she did is Bo Derek came to her rescue with this grotesque picture of the skull of some woman. We don't know who it is. Bo Derek claims that it's, by the way, Bo Derek, Bo Derek did not even have the proper name of this um, this queen that she supposed to have been um, emulating. She mm. said, it's just a hairstyle. This is Bo Derek speaking, right? It's just <laughs> a hairstyle. We all copied it from Queen Nofratari. Who is Queen Nofratari? Was she trying to say Nefertiti? She missed. <laughs> Bo Derek speaks out to defend Kim Kardashian for calling her cornrows Bo Derek braids. And then Bo Derek goes on to say, hey, it's just a hairstyle that I wore in the movie 10. Kim Kardashian calls it the Bo Derek because she copied my pattern of braids. I copied it from Ann Margaret's backup singer from her Vegas show. Okay. And then she goes on to say the comment about how we all copied it from Queen Nofertari. I hope her royal highness is flattered. <laughs> oh my God. And you know what? Since the beginning of time, they have been capitalizing on our mm -hmm. creativity and our they make creativity. profit from everything we come up with. It's ridiculous. Exactly. Okay. Right. You know what? We can we can say on the flip side, you know, black women straighten their hair. You're trying to uh assimilate. Well, assimilation Those things, hold on a second. Yeah. Those things happen because of survival. When your life is on the line, you're going to straighten, you're going to do whatever it takes to live and your children Don't live. live. Right. It's, it was out of a necessity for life. So I just wanted to point that out. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and as you're saying it, what I'm saying is that that's assimilation. That's not misappropriation. Uh, corporation. That's not. Exactly acculturation and it's not borrowed or stolen culture. Now exactly. here's now remember the best kind of PR is when you apologize for real when you make a mistake. Give yes. a real <laughs> apology, not a half apology, not a miss apology. Here's what Kim Kardashian said when she was busted. Okay, so this this writer is um from Santa Monica, California. And his name, her name is Taryn Tank. And she says, maybe Kim is right. She wouldn't have received such a backlash if she hadn't credited Bo Derek, but she did. It also didn't make matters any better when she decided to post the photo on her Instagram with the caption, hi, can I get zero Fs please? Thanks. Oh my God, are you serious? That doesn't exactly send the best message of her trying not to disrespect other cultures. Mm -hmm. In fact, as previously mentioned, her photo caption appeared dismissive and rude to anyone who felt offended by her hair choice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can I get zero Fs? Like, I don't wow. care. 
who were offended. What do you think, audience? What's going on over there? You know, this, that was very offensive, you know, and, you know, to steal outright take outright not credit a, 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 a group of people that is responsible for these hairstyles. You know, why do you want a big behind? Is it just, I woke up one day and said, you know what, I want a big dairy hair. Is that what it is? No, it, you know, you see the black woman with the power, with the fro, with the strutting down the street with her dairy hair and, and, and it's, she's voluptuous. And that's what a lot of people, a lot of groups want to look like. You don't just wake up and say, I want thick lips. I want a, I want big hips. You, you know, especially when a lot of people are straight up six o'clock, iron board backside, you know, <laughs> you, you kind of want a big, uh, uh, some type, something tootie back there. You do, <laughs> you want it, you want it tooted up, you know, you do. You do. I haven't heard that word in years since my grandmother was living. <laughs> Tyra Banks says it. <laughs> so you you have to get these looks these desires from somewhere to, you want to emulate and you want to steal and you want and you don't want to um give compensation for different things that you're doing right and you don't want you definitely don't want to give credit where credit is due and look at how Bo Derek went all the way back to who she thought was what did she call her queen mm -hmm. no for Atari. <laughs> if you're going to go back to Queen Nefertiti, that's one thing. But you know darn well, Bo Derek, you were walking down a street in Manhattan or in Harlem or Queens or Oakland or someplace, and you saw a sister with those braids. Mm -hmm. She did. And my that's did my hair like that for sixth grade picture. I got a picture with with that exact hairstyle my aunt did to my hair when I was a little kid. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right, she yeah. didn't do that kind of research that ended up on the internet with that skull and those braids, which was really inappropriate, disrespectful, and insulting. All you know in what? Her. She didn't even she didn't even have to go back that far. She could have went to um, um, a Cicely Tyson because yes. she was known for wearing the braids and making it very popular in there in a time in the '60s. That's and right. she had that hairstyle. Cicely Tyson has a picture with that exact hairstyle with the braid coming out the, over the ear she yes. has a picture exactly it's just interesting exactly. it's just really hmm. interesting so okay now let's get on rachel dolezal that's that's sister man hmm. so you know what's interesting okay so she does this whole facade this whole charade she ends up being the president of the naacp as a black woman which she is not and D.Y., do we have the video where her parents are telling us that she's not a black woman? While you bring that up, I'll just say that she claims after she did all of this facade, she, she made all this money and gained all this popularity in the black community. Now she says that unfortunately, she changed her name as Auntie Genoa said. And it's just interesting what she changed it to. But <laughs> she said that, unfortunately, the press said that I chose it randomly, which I didn't, she explains. And at the end of the book, which she's promoting a book, mm -hmm. at the end of the book, I discussed that an Igbo man reached out to me and really just said that we see you. My <laughs> tribe sees you for who you are. A white woman. I see in your soul. And you're incarnated into this white envelope. And you were brought here as a gift from the gods to challenge white supremacy spiritually. Come on. There's the Igbo man. I challenge anybody to find this man she's talking about. They don't mention his name. They don't mention when the conversation took place. None of it. So she's None probably exists. getting it in. My other question about her is... Uh, Auntie Genoa mentioned that she's having this black experience where people won't hire her because she's claimed to be a black woman. But my question is, is this because she's having the black experience or just because she's a big fat liar? Hmm. It's because she's delusional and she does not, and she's unapologetic about it. 
that's what the problem is. She, she, and and, and everybody that um, from the interviews and everything I looked at, they could only shake her head because uh, uh, shake their head because she will not accept responsibility for um, what she's done. And as a matter of fact, on one the interview that I watched, the reason that she said that she uh, morphed into how she looked mm-hmm. is her parents had um, had adopted uh, four black children. And um, she ended up with custody of them. And the one of the the, the oldest one said he didn't want to um, um, want anybody to know that he was adopted. And so, in order for him not to look like he was adopted, then then, then she she made this deceptive lie where she made herself look black. Mm. And, so, and, and 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 she didn't see anything wrong with that. But that's deceptive. Yes, it is. And you know what? And just like you were saying earlier, the black experience, Auntie Genoa, she will never Never. have a black experience. Never. Never. Because she can dilly dally out of it with all the pain and suffering as a race of people, African people. Mm -hmm. We could never dilly dally out of, okay, today I want to be black and today I want to be white. We could not do that. Now no. there's some instances where there's passing, but for the but they were passing for their lives. But for the most part, she will never be um, have that black experience. Never, never. No. And this name that she named herself, I want to give credit to Awesomely Lovey. I love Awesomely Lovey. There's some things in this article I cannot repeat on this show because it's much <laughs> different than Awesomely Lovey show. But I just want to. <laughs> She said she gave herself names from at least two different countries on the continent. Nakechi is from the Igbo tribe in Nigeria, and it means gift of God. Mm. Yalo is Fulani and can be traced to both Guinea and Senegal. It means bold. Oh, she's definitely bold. Mm -hmm. Black, she's not. D.Y., do we have that video of her parents now? Ethnicity. Our daughter is primarily German and Czech and of European descent. So she's white. Caucasian. She's white. Mm-hmm. Rachel has wanted to be someone she's not. She's, she's chosen not to just be herself, but to represent herself as an African-American woman or a biracial person. Yes, Rachel is a master artist, and so she's able to disguise herself and make her appearance look like any ethnicity. She could accomplish the work that she set out to do in the beginning by being herself mm-hmm. and being a, a white woman who's an advocate for the African American. I could wow. myself, Mama. Mama. Exactly. And let me add let me add this. When she was going to the to the college, she put she she put up a lawsuit against the college because they wouldn't because her artwork that she had was taken down. This lady gets like um, ten grand and up up for the stuff that she creates, and she was her white self when she did that. Mm-hmm. Um, she, she, uh, citing some type of uh, discrimination th- then, and she was at the college then, right. and, 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 and she still and she's making money off this artwork. And now, the irony of that, she copied her main piece from another black artist. Mm -hmm. So you talk about cultural appropriation all the way down to the nth degree. And, you know, we're using her as an example, a prime example, because she's so iconic in terms of this topic. But there are so many others who are taking advantage of that cultural misappropriation. I found a whole list of them. I mean, just... Oh my God! So we're gonna just go on and and get past her because we've had too much fun on one fella. Let's <laughs> 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 move into our next segment, please. <laughs> Oh my goodness, cultural appropriation. Let's start at the fashion industry. Billions and billions of dollars. Let's just start right there. Um, Versace, Louis Vuitton. Let's talk about those two. 
And everyone knows these are global, um, iconic um, fashion moguls. And they have taken, they've gone into different tribes around Africa and, and have stolen, ripped off, taken, slapped their name on it, and made billions and without giving any of those Af African tribes the um, not only acknowledgement, but there was no compensation. That's a shame. Okay. Wow. So let's so let's just talk. Let's, let's okay. So Masasi, the Messiah of Kenya and Tanzania, embodied one of the most powerful images of the tribal Africa, and it's becoming increasingly imitated. Companies around the world have for some now, for some time now, continued to exploit the Messiah iconic cultural brand. And, um, and, and these products are still increasing sales. Um, for the most, the most familiar perhaps uh, is Louis Vuitton's collection, a 2012 spring collection, the men collection, which included hats, shirts, scarves, and was it was inspired by the Masasi Shuka. Mm. A traditional African blanket that casts co colorful shades of red and blue. Wow. wow. Look at that. Oh my God. And if and if memory serves everyone, if you think about the lumberjack, because I was looking at that and I was like, look at this. That the, 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 it does look like a lumberjack um, fabric. I was I was like, look at this. This has been stolen stolen um dy is um the the clip you have the clip brands who have stolen from African tribes and given them no credit at all. The Louis Vuitton monogram was made in 1896, but parts of it was actually stolen from a Quili tribal mask. The Louis Vuitton damier bean was stolen from the Cuba chief's formal attire from the Cuba kingdom oh in Congo, God. Africa. The Versace Greca print was also stolen from the Cuba tribe and the Fumban tribe in Cameroon. The Louis Vuitton men's collection in 2012 was inspired by the Maasai Shuka, a traditional African blanket casting in colorful shades of red and blue, the design stolen from the Maasai tribe of Kenya and Tanzania. Louis Vuitton also created in 2014 the tribal mask chain wallet. Is it just inspiration or is it cultural appropriation? And should these tribes be compensated with the profits that these brands are getting? Wow. Yeah, <clears throat> this is what I'm talking about. You know what? A lot of people recognize um, what is being taken, what is being stolen, what is being um, 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 taken from a cultural and make billions and not even give a credit to that that culture. See, this, this is a hurtful thing because we as a people and Af African people want to be able to have money for our generations of children. Right. And, and, and if we're still being um, um, just pushed to the side, not giving credit or giving credit, you know, 50 years or 100 or 20, 200 years later, what about our children? What are we leading? What are we leaving them? There is a lot of things here. There's a lot of meat on the bone right now. And we need to we need to recognize the fact that this stuff took from the mouths of the next generation and the next generation and the next generation. And I can't help but to say that because it, it hurts the fact that, the, that we could, that we didn't prosper off of our own sweat and blood and hard work. While again, in the midst of sitting in oppress, oppression, beatings, killings, separation. Come on now. Yeah, it's a lot. Okay. So, so, aunties, I'm going to throw it back at you. Wow. You That's know what I'm going to say. Okay, so recently I read an article about Chanel. We're talking about the designers, right? Mm -hmm. Chanel did not want Black people. It is, a, it is a fact. It is in writing, Black and white. They did not want Black people to wear Chanel in the hoods and in our black communities because they felt that it devalued their brand. Wow. So if you notice 
every year, Chanel products go up just a little bit more and a little bit more because they're trying to make it so that black people can't afford to wear their product. Well, I say, you know what? Why wear it anyway? Exactly. Why does it benefit us? But you know that we'll wear anything, we'll do anything, we'll spend any amount of money to assimilate to the culture that oppresses and can't stand us. Loves what we have. Oh, yeah. Loves what we do. Loves what we create, mm -hmm. but can't stand us. So I say poo poo to the designers. And I agree with Auntie Rose on the point that we need to start investing in our own designers and buying from our own designers because then it does create generational wealth. Yes. Those children, those uh, uh, African American, Black American children who are going to be our leaders in the future. Yes. And there's that capital. Why can you know what's so funny about this whole thing? Because I'm 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 a, I'm a big proponent of that. Um, in our family, um, I didn't know we had a family plantation, but we did. Uh, my grandparents, when they got married, uh, my grandmother, my great grandmother, gave my my grandfather and my grandmother a, a piece of property, um, uh, and she told them when she gave it to them that never sell it. And my grandmother told me it was it was it, the the ground was mucky. They couldn't grow anything on there, and 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 they left it. And it turns out it was a it was a, a there was oil, and they're mm -hmm. still pumping oil out of this property to this day. Right. The people who, who who have it now, and, and and I was trying to figure out well 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 what happened. And and the thing is, when people start saying stuff, you got I have to remember. My grandmother and my grandfather only had a second and third grade ed, um, uh, um, education, and they managed to raise a, um, um, a, a, a several families and, and able to have a life and everything. They they lived to be in, in, in their 80s, but they had a second and third grade education and the property that my grandmother, my great my grandmother's grandmother had been holding on that she gave to them. It, it, it didn't profit the family. Some other family is profiting off this property, this piece of property, yeah. right now. It's it's it's, 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 it's it's still like, yeah, yeah. I mean, there's there's so much of it that we could go on for like eight hours on this topic. We really could. That's true. Um, That's true. But as I said, we did we did only select just a few, and I just wanted to really um, emphasize before we move on from this topic how important it is to have our own to start to to build our own generational wealth yes and even though we're in a in some somewhat no not somewhat we are in a very oppressive society in a lot of yeah. ways mm -hmm. we still have survived to this point and thrived to this point so there's nothing that can stop us from reaching the next level there's just nothing. not at all Exactly. So up all of these people and all of the cultural appropriation and all of those things, what I want to bring in is the knowledge and the hope that we can get past, no matter what they do. Because exactly. that's what here's what's interesting. No matter how much they steal, we still produce more. Still. Right? Right? Exactly. Exactly. You know what? Um, Louis Vuitton logo was actually created based around uh, the tribal mass of the Keeley, uh, Queeley, I'm sorry, tribe. Mm -hmm. And the Versace Greca printed originated from the Kuba tribe and, and the Fumbu tribe. So mm -hmm. they go out and no compensation, of course, they go out to these remote areas and go to, and like they often, like they've been doing for years. Right. And they just go and they look and they just practically just take it out of their hands. Like they took a people. Mm. And like they, they took a people. Billions and billions. And, billions. and, and it, it, it stems with slavery because if you got a group of people that's built this country from their sweat, blood, and, 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 and you took a people, now you're taking the culture. And and you're making light of it. It's like it's no big deal. Like um, um, Bo Derek when she said, "Oh, it's just a hairstyle." 
It's mm -hmm. just a hairstyle. Then yes, why are you wearing it? And why are you not giving credit where credit is due? Why, why are you not up front? Why? 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 If it's why? Just a hairstyle. Like that, that movie made her a, se a sex symbol, an icon. And so obviously that hair she thought was very sexy. Of course. And so, so why, why, why did it matter whether you wore it or not? Every white girl wanted their hair braided like that back then when that movie was out. They all wanted their hair braided because I, I, I used to braid hair back then. Could you do my hair like that? No. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you know they were charging three hundred dollars for those braids. Three hundred dollars for those braids. And today you you can go to a, a sister and get your hair done for one hundred and fifty or a little bit more. But three hundred dollars back then per head. So are you saying in the white done. salons, in the white salons, or are you saying that the sisters were making three hundred? No, in the white salons. I mean, of course, I'm sure they found some sisters to do it. I'm sure, but yes, in the white salon, it was three hundred dollars. Right, and so the sister was head to look yeah. like that. She was a, the and sister was making the full three hundred anyway. If she's in a white salon, no, oh, no, 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 no. The 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 braider was white. So let, let's talk about another trend that's coming up and let's do that in my segment. DY. Thank you. Here we are. I want to talk about Brazilian butt lifts. And I want to talk about how our literal bodies have been misappropriated and culturally appropriated. But I also want to talk about where that started, because a lot of people think, oh, well, you know, it's just the beauty of the Black body, the Black woman's body. But there is one sister that I want to pay homage to tonight, and her name is Sarah Bartman. At the end of apartheid, the beginning of the 19th century, she was a servant and also a exotic freak attraction for the Europeans. She was born in South Africa, a member of the Khoi Khoi tribe. And the Khoi Khois had been nomads for centuries, freely roaming, minding their business. And they were literally going from place to place trying to find greenery for, for their livestock. In 1790, when Sarah was born, the Khoi Khoi were engaged in a heavy war with the Dutch who were trying to colonize Africa at that time, the Cape Town area. And the Khoi Khoi took to the mountains and to watch and attack the Dutch as they were coming in. Well, then that left the women and the children vulnerable. And Sarah was one of those children. And so the Khoi Khoi were nearly made extinct because this commando band from you know the Dutch came over and, and claimed that the Khoi Khoi were stealing their cattle. And so they were killing thousands and thousands from the Khoi Khoi tribe, nearly extinct. And they were saying that it was okay because the feeling was that, hey, you know what? These people aren't human anyway. They're near human, but they're not like us. So there were actual eyewitness accounts of how all this went down. So at the end of the day, after the Khoi Khois were dispersed, practically extinct and, and dispersed, let's get a picture of Sarah up. They took this young girl. She had been given to a Hendrix Caesar, right? Actually, she was a on a farming she was a, a servant on a farm. And Hendrick Caesar and Alex Dumlop, who was a scientist, decided to take this girl over to Europe and make her an exhibit. It was because she had a large behind. And it seemed to them to be exotic and to be, you know, they had these fantasies about black women and their behinds. And they have been focusing on this tribe for the longest and absolutely were just fixated on this woman, fixated on this tribe. So I think it's just interesting that Kim Kardashian, 
Yeah, mm-hmm. we're back again. I also, um, oh my God, what is her name? The Latina, the Latina uh, rapper. Cardi. Jennifer Love. Oh, Cardi. No, Cardi B. Cardi B, yeah. Cardi B. All of them. Ebo. I'm sorry, the, the tribe is pronounced Ebo. Michelle McIntyre is letting me know. Thank you very much, Michelle McIntyre. Ebo. And the bottom line is they took this woman over to Europe and they just exploited her. You talk about cultural appropriation. At some point, the Europeans started putting bustles on the back of their dresses to make their bottoms look like Sarah Bartman at the same time being repulsed by her, so-called being repulsed by her. So I just wanted to bring that to light and pay homage to Sarah. She thought that she was going to be getting at least a portion of what they were exhibiting her for. She never agreed that she would be there for the rest of her in her life. They had her in a cage mm-hmm. and then they would call her out of the cage, push her back into the cage. And then at some point in, in 1810, the examiner in Paris chronicled that she had been taken from London to Paris and sold to an animal trainer. Mm. There were points in her existence in that environment where they were treating her as if she had a choice, like she was a free agent. They took her to court. The abolitionists took her to court so that they could try to get her free. But in court, they examined her. They interviewed her for about three hours straight in Dutch language which she did not speak. And at the end of the day, they decided that she had chosen this life for herself. She loves Paris. She wants to stay here. And within 18 months after she went to Paris, she had died. And that wasn't the end of it. They took her body parts, carved out her genitals, took her body parts, and made a facsimile of it and took the body parts and put them into lab tubes. I'm talking about fetishism of the black body. I'm talking about fetishism of our culture, our creativity, our intellectual property, and all the things that we embody. As if those things are important but we are not. Mm. The cultural mm. appropriation is real. You can take that one down, D.Y., and show us a caricature of what they did with Sarah Bartman. There were a lot of caricatures that were drawn of her, as if to say that, you know, she's a cartoon. She's not a real person. If we, like with slave, the enslaved, if we prove that they're not quite human and that they're part animal, then we can make this be okay. Mm-hmm. And I noticed that that still goes on. It absolutely yeah. still occurs. And for people who say that it does it, it absolutely does. And if, even if it's not a caricature, a drawing or an actual cartoon, it's the way that we're portrayed. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's in our music. It's our music. I think about, and it's okay. You don't need to bring up Sarah Bartman. I think we get the idea, but I just wanted to pay her homage as we go into the cultural appropriation in music. One of the people that I wanted to focus on is Elvis Presley, for sure, because it's very interesting that John Lennon, of all people of the Beatles, John Lennon had said at one point that there was nothing, there was nothing until Elvis arrived on the scene. Well, there would be no Elvis without a whole host of Black artists that Mm -hmm. came forward. I was surprised to hear that John Lennon had famously said that before Mm -hmm. there was nothing, but there was in reality, a whole host of black artists who helped shape Elvis's sound, his movements, his whole image, all of who he was. And I heard, and I have not been able to find the actual written proof about this, but I have heard that Elvis in the end said that all that a Negro could do is buy his records and shine his shoes. And if he didn't say it, it sounds very much like someone from that era, having come from the background that he came from, would say. So Ray Charles had shared his thoughts on Elvis and how he had co-opted his sound from Black artists. 
Charles expressed that Presley was just doing our kind of music and getting recognized for it because he was a white man. He caused a lot of the populace, usually when people say populace, they usually mean white people, to start listening to a lot of music that normally they wouldn't have been listening to. Ray yeah. expressed in the interview. He copied music from Sister Rosetta Tharp. He copied music from Arthur Big Boy Crudup. He copied music from Big Mama Thornton, Fats Domino, and so many others. Chuck Berry, the way that he was moving, the way that he would go across the stage, just all of it. You can see us all throughout all of his performances. And somebody wanted to say that, you know, Elvis doesn't just, he didn't just take borrow. I'm sorry, they said borrow. <laughs> they took. But borrow. He borrowed not only from, you know, the black people, but he also borrowed from country music and gospel. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last time I checked, gospel is a black genre. Exactly. So it's give credit where credit is due. There is a, a young man who teaches at the Berkeley School of Music. His name is Ruka Hatura Sara White. And he says that corporate, cultural appropriation is the adoption of an element or elements of one's culture by members of another culture. This can be controversial when members of a dominant culture appropriate from disadvantaged minority cultures. Unlike acculturation and assimilation, cultural appropriation echoes domains of economic dominance mm. and is the act of colon I'm sorry, colonization. Mm -hmm. which reign extended authority over a group of people and or territories. And the brother in the end says, borrowing from other cultures is inevitable, but there are positive ways in which it can be done. We should engage with other cultures on more than just an aesthetic level. And we should also give credit to where credit is due. Yes. Pay homage and acknowledge the source. And so I promised at the beginning that I would tell you why I believe that cultural appropriation is so damaging to black people. It hurts. Yes. That's why. Because cultural appropriation wouldn't be such a bad thing if people would say where they're getting their information, their creativity, their fashion, their IP, all of that from. And the reason it hurts black Americans so badly is because when we were brought to this country, we were seasoned. We were stripped of our culture. We were stripped of our names. We were stripped of our religions. We were stripped of absolutely everything that was a process of debasing us and breaking our spirits. And so when we are culturally appropriated, that's what it rings back to. That is still living in our DNA. Mm -hmm. And so I want to say that I definitely don't want to think for one moment or uh, propagate that we should just be angry about cultural appropriation. I think we're not as angry as we are hurt. Yeah. Because it hits that wound in us. Someone saying that we need to have a part two. I agree because we're at the end of our hour. Mm. And I definitely want to bring up Unique's comment that they're still doing it to this day. TikTok exposed the Charlie DeMello girl who got all the opportunities and the young black girl got nothing. Yes, I saw that too. Well, ladies, we're going to have to close. Wow, wow. this was a just a lot. It was a lot. But in the end, remember, there's more where our creativity came from. And that on that note, we are your aunties. And hopefully we will see you next week. We want to just encourage you to continue to keep on keeping on. Don't let all of these things affect you in a negative way and trigger you. Instead, take it as information that you can use to take you to the next level and have a better understanding. Ladies, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, audience. We really appreciate you. Yes, Michelle, I agree. We do need to do a part two. We do. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And we'll see you next week. Bye.